Thank you for joining us for a study of God's Word at Let the Bible Speak. In our journey through the book of Ephesians, we have now arrived at Ephesians 4. Notice the message of the Holy Spirit in verses 1 through 6. I, therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you to walk worthy of the calling with which you were called, with all lowliness and gentleness, with long suffering, bearing with one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. Similar to how the Apostle Paul spends the first 11 chapters in the letter to the church at Rome, Elaborating on the goodness of God and enumerating the divine blessings enjoyed by God's people. So in the Ephesian letter, the Apostle Paul spends the first three chapters highlighting how good God has been to the Christians at Ephesus. Someone has said that in Ephesians chapter 1 through chapter 3, we find how God sees us. In Christ, and in Ephesians 4 through 6, we learn how the world should see Christ in us. God's plan for peace and unity after our song. Spirit transitions from privileges to responsibilities with the word therefore in both Ephesians chapter 4 and Romans chapter 12. Have you ever noticed the similarity of approach in these two epistles? After piling up the lengthy list of reasons that both Jewish and Gentile Christians should have gratitude to God, the Apostle Paul writes in Romans 12 verse 1, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. In a similar way, the Apostle Paul moves from the spiritual benefits emphasized in Ephesians chapters 1 to 3 to the individual responsibilities in response to his goodness in Ephesians 4 verse 1. I therefore... The prisoner of the Lord beseech you to walk worthy of the calling with which you were called. He mentions in passing his acceptance of prison time as something in line with the Lord's will. While this would dominate the mind of an ordinary individual, the apostle shows far greater concern in promoting spiritual truths for his brothers and sisters. In both letters, the Apostle Paul lays a solid foundation to the promotion of righteous living. 
Using the word beseech in both accounts, the apostle pleads with them, and by extension all Christians, to honor God by their lives in light of the overwhelming generosity of God towards them. How easy it is to pass over the significance of the word beseech in the apostle's approach. The apostle's winsomeness surely factors into his effectiveness. Interestingly, the word translated exhorted in 1 Thessalonians 2, verse 11 and 12, is the word parakaleo that is translated beseech in Romans 12, verse 1 and Ephesians 4, verse 1. Do you see what the apostle Paul is doing? He's not browbeating. We can be kind and gentle with most people and still get the point across, 1 Thessalonians 2, verse 7. If we can get the point across calmly and respectfully, thunderous disrespect will not likely help. It's just human nature. Knowing, therefore, the terror of the Lord, we persuade men, 2 Corinthians 5, verse 11. We see Jesus with the Samaritan woman at the well in John 4, and the Apostle Paul with the pagans at the Areopagus in Athens in Acts chapter 17, verse 16 through 33, use wisdom and respect in employing the tools of persuasion. Les Giblin writes, you can't make the other fella feel important in your presence if you secretly feel he's a nobody. We can value those in error without approving error. Consider this quote from Les Giblin's book, How to Have Confidence and Power in Dealing with People. Perhaps the most exhaustive research work that has ever been done on arguments was performed by Professors Alvin Bussey and Richard Borden, formerly with New York University's speech department. These professors listened to 10,000 actual arguments over a seven-year period. They listened to hassles between taxi drivers, between husbands and wives, within business firms and debates at the UN. They made notes of who won the argument and why. They came to the interesting conclusion that professional debaters, politicians, UN delegates were less successful than door-to-door salesmen in getting their ideas accepted. The one big reason turned out to be that the professional debaters seemed to be intent upon beating down the opposition or showing up the opposing argument, whereas the salesman was trying to induce the prospect to want to change his own mind. They found that the one big mistake most of us make in trying to win an argument is in attacking the ego of the other person. It all boils down to this. You must learn to work with human nature rather than against it. And the idea inherent In the word beseech, the Apostle Paul uses is to teach, urge, plead, entreat, encourage, and console. That's how the word's translated. 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 11, this is the English Standard Version. Therefore, encourage, same word, one another and build one another up just as you were doing. We find the same concept in Hebrews 10, 24, in the context of assembling with the church. And let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works. Hebrews 10, 25 teaches us to encourage one another. If we constantly correct others without the context of a positive relationship and positive interaction, we will tend to not encourage, but discourage. And so we assemble in part to avoid being isolated from one another so we can be there for one another. And this takes time. The urgency of this closeness and mutual dependence is illustrated by the giant sequoia trees of California that tower up to 300 feet. These massive trees have shallow root systems that reach out in all directions to capture the greatest amount of surface moisture. As their roots extend horizontally, the intertwining roots of the juxtaposed trees weave a network of support which provides stability against violent storms. Think about the storms of life. In short, these gentle giants are so constructed by their creator that they need each other, which explains why you see them growing assembled together in clusters. I think not forsaking their assembling together. Seldom do you see a giant redwood standing alone. 
because the high winds would quickly uproot the shallow root system of these loners. We need each other, and we need each other's encouragement. Someone has suggested six ways to encourage others. Number one, assist with their material needs as you are able. Drop a line. Send notes of encouragement. Number three, reach out and touch. Give an appropriate touch such as a pat, a hug, and so on. Number four, listen up. Listen actively. Number five, empathize. Comfort others in their pain. Number six, give of your time. Give undivided attention. Well, next, seven times in the Ephesian letter, the Apostle Paul uses the term walk to describe either a godly lifestyle or a worldly lifestyle. He describes the godly lifestyle in Ephesians 2, verse 10, walk in good works. Ephesians 5, verse 2, walk in love. Ephesians 5, verse 8, walk as children of light. Ephesians 5, 15, Walk wisely and circumspectly. He describes the worldly lifestyle in terms of walking in Ephesians 2, verse 2. You once walked in trespasses and sins. Ephesians 4, verse 7. No longer walk in the futility of your mind. Chapter 5, verse 15. Walk not as fools. This language, of course, walking, floods the scriptures. Psalm 1, verse 1, Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly. Romans 4, verse 12, Walk in the steps of the faith which our father Abraham had while still uncircumcised. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 17, We walk by faith, not by sight. Galatians 5, 16, Walk in the Spirit. The scriptures speak again with even greater specificity, as we've noticed, with walking worthy in Colossians 1.10 and 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 11 and 12. As you know how we exhorted and comforted and charged every one of you as a father does his own children, that you would walk worthy of God who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. Now, at first glance, the idea of walking worthy may sound like a bridge too far. How can I possibly be worthy? Well, I'm not. But while we maintain the appropriate evaluation of ourselves, we can walk worthy. We can live upright, conscientious lives. Jesus illustrates this blend of humility and righteous activity in Luke chapter 17, verse 10. He says, so likewise you, when you have done all those things which you were commanded, say, we are unprofitable servants. We have done what was our duty to do. While we are not worthy of all God has done for us, we may walk worthy. We may live a lifestyle that honors the Lord for what he's done for us. Well, let's move to Ephesians 4. And look at verses 2 and 3, where the Holy Spirit explains ways in which we may walk worthy of the calling with which we were called. Obviously, in light of all God has done for us, this request is eminently reasonable. With all lowliness and gentleness, with long-suffering, bearing with one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. You know, sometimes we think only doctrinal truth is required for obtaining and maintaining unity and peace. But if we are serious about endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace, we need to understand the importance of the right attitude towards others. We do not walk worthy of our calling when we have an air of superiority. We do not walk worthy of our calling when we have a condescending, holier-than-thou, smarter-than-thou, more knowledgeable-than-thou attitude. You remember the contrast between the Pharisee and the publican in Luke chapter 18, verses 9 through 14? The Bible says, Also he spoke this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised Others, verse 10, 
Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God, thank you that I am not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I possess. And the tax collector, standing afar off, would not so much as raise his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Jesus says, I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. I need to ask, which of these individuals best illustrate how I view myself and how I carry myself? The Apostle Paul certainly passed the test. He wrote in 1 Timothy 1.15, Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am chief. He said in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 9, For I am the least of the apostles, who am not worthy to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. In Ephesians 3, verse 8, he described himself as less than the least of all the saints. Remarkable. The Apostle Paul. This type of spirit, though, fosters unity and peace. I read in the International Critical Commentary that the humble man, listen, is content to be treated as if he were the most insignificant man in the room. That resonates with me. I need to grow in maturity and self-awareness to see myself that way. Notice the first pair of these words here. He says, with all lowliness and gentleness. Now think about the relationship between lowliness and humility to meekness and gentleness. You see, meekness and gentleness will show up on the outside when genuine lowliness or humility is on the inside. The word translated meekness in the King James or gentleness in the New King James does not mean weakness, but actually the opposite, power under control. In ancient times, this word described the powerful stallion who was so meek or gentle that a child could safely ride on his back. The same word also means courteous, considerate, and thoughtful. I need to behave myself that way. When disagreements arise, and they inevitably will, the spirit of the gentleman will promote reconciliation, while the harsh and overbearing man will generate needless conflict and unrest. Consider Galatians 6, verse 1. Brethren, if a man is overtaken in any trespass, you who are spiritual restore such a one in the spirit of meekness or gentleness. Proverbs 15, verse 1 also fits here. A soft answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. And of course, this interferes with peace and unity. Just as gentleness is the expression of humility, so bearing with others is the expression of long-suffering. A long-suffering spirit manifests itself in bearing with others in a slowness to avenge wrongs, for example, international critical commentary. Understanding, it means being sympathetic. And so that brings us to verse three. Endeavoring to keep the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. When we seriously pursue these qualities, humility, gentleness, long-suffering, and loving forbearance, we endeavor, we exert ourselves, and we demonstrate an eagerness to maintain peace and unity. On the other hand, quickly getting out over one's skis, eager for a beatdown, will generate unrest instead, almost without exception. Now that we've covered the basic character and conduct requisite for unity and peace, the Spirit moves to the doctrinal content essential for promoting Unity. We've got to have the right spirit, the right attitude, but we've got to have the truth. We need to be on the same page on the doctrines that we're calling the seven ones. Let's look at Ephesians 4, 
verse 4 through 6. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is above all and through all and in you all. Sadly, great controversy surrounds these fundamental truths. Could the Spirit have been any plainer than to say there is one body? Well, Jesus had, of course, one physical body. But here the Apostle Paul refers to the spiritual body, the church. While the religious world insists that, well, you know, one church is as good as any other, the Bible says there is only one body. In the same letter, the Apostle says the church is his body. If there's only one body, there's only one church, Ephesians 1, 22 and 23. Again, in the same letter, the Spirit tells us that Jesus is the Savior of the body, Ephesians 5, 23. Jesus said, I will build my church, singular, Matthew 16, verse 18. And so why align yourself with one of the many man-made organizations that are competing with the church Christ built? This theme of one body permeates the Apostle Paul's writings, Romans 12, 4 and 5, 1 Corinthians 12, 12 through 20, Colossians 3, verse 15. Imagine how Jesus sees the proliferation of bodies or churches, claiming not only a right to existence, but demanding the acceptance of those within the one body of Christ. Before Christ, for hundreds and hundreds of years, Division reigned between pagans and Jews. Jesus' death on the cross destroyed the barriers that caused that division. Ephesians 2.16, that he might reconcile them both to God in one body through the cross, thereby putting to death the enmity or hostility. After that, that Christ has done, who would raise up walls and barriers after Jesus knocked them down through the cross? Who would support such organizations that strive to compete with the body of Christ? When we think of one body as a doctrinal demand of unity, we must see more than the physical body of Christ and one spiritual body of Christ, the church. We must see the one loaf, the one communion body, shared in each congregation on the first day of the week. The Apostle Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 10, 17, For we, though many, are one bread and one body, for we all partake of that one bread. The New American Standard and a host of other translations render that, for we all partake of that one bread, one loaf. Why make the number one complicated? The Lord didn't make it hard. C.E.W. Doris writes in the Gospel Advocate Commentary by Mark, a loaf does not mean two or more loaves, but one. The loaf which was one points to the body of Jesus Christ. Jesus had one body, and the one loaf represents that one body. Two loaves on the Lord's table are out of place and have no divine sanction. Alexander Campbell writes in the Christian system, As there is but one literal body, and but one mystical or figurative body, having many members, so there must be one one loaf. Barton Stone writes in the Christian Messenger, in the Lord's Supper there should be but one loaf to represent the Lord's body that suffered on the cross. Two or more loaves, or wafers I might add, destroy the very idea of the ordinance as not representing the one body of Christ suffering and dying. This morning, can you really say you are endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace? If you worship with a congregation that uses two or more loaves and wafers, request a book copy of the booklet that I wrote titled Unity in One Loaf and One Cup to read more on the scriptural observance of the Lord's Supper. I come to the
We're glad that you joined us this morning and hope you will join us every Lord's Day. Of course, the program cannot substitute for assembling with the saints. God would frown on that. See Hebrews 10, verse 24 and 25. Please join us for worship at one of the congregations listed shortly. Call or write for a free transcript, CD, or DVD copy of number 1219, God's Plan for Peace and Unity. You can request at no cost the Truth Freeze Six Lesson Bible Study by mail. We close with the words the Apostle Paul issues in Romans 16, verse 16, the churches of Christ salute you. Until next week, goodbye, and may God bless you.